You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. It is a dangerous world out there. Volatility is on the rise and your clients' portfolios are under assault from a growing number of threats. Simple diversification is no longer enough to shield the assets under your protection. Registered investment advisors, financial planners, and asset managers need a new weapon in their war on risk. Welcome to the Advisor's Option, the program designed to arm busy advisors with the information necessary to properly manage risk in this volatile environment. From options education, trading strategies and tips, to industry news and interviews with leading advisors, you'll find it all on the Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Swan Wealth Advisors. Since 1997, Swan has been the leader in hedged equity and option income strategies with GIPS verified results. Swan provides unique and valuable solutions to the inherent weaknesses of asset allocation. Offering defined risk strategies that allow upside participation while also protecting advisors and investors against market risk. For more information about our advisor program for separately managed accounts, the Swan Defined Risk Mutual Fund, or our proprietary option overlay strategies, please contact Randy Swan at swanwealthadvisors.com. Think outside the style box. Think Swan when deciding on risk management solutions to market risk. And now, it's time to arm yourself with the latest weapons in the war on risk. It's time for the advisor's option. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again for the Advisor's Option, the program here on the old Options Insider Radio Network, where we break down some of the amazing developments going on in the world of options, as well as some of the information you, as a busy advisor, should know about the world of options and indeed the options product, as well as, of course, for those of you out there looking for a new advisor or asset manager, some of the things you may want to keep in mind when you're checking these people out. No shortage of topics for us to get to on the old program, and indeed no shortage of content in this show and in all the programs here on the old Options Insider Radio Network. Many, many great archive episodes of this program for you guys to sink your teeth into if you're a newcomer just discovering the show for the first time. And there's a lot of places you can go to check out that content, including probably the easiest place being theoptionsinsider.com. Surf on over there, click on the top left corner Insider Radio Network tab. All 13 shows pop up, and you're pretty much good to go from there. Choose your show, download, stream, whatever you prefer, and you're off to the races. Of course, all the major providers will also have it, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want to just have it all shoveled to you the moment, the instant it is available, you don't want to deal with those other services, just grab our app, available for iOS, Android, and indeed the Fire OS. No shortage of ways for you guys to download, stream, listen to the show, and then while you're listening... While you're enjoying it, maybe you have a question. Hey, how does this work? How does that work? What do you mean by that? Let us know. We love to hear from you guys. I'm going to feature some of you guys on the program again today. And joining me on the old Advisors Option program today, my co-host here on the old AO program, Mr. Randy Swan, the co-founder of Swan Global Investments. Randy, welcome back to the program. It's kind of a bit of a weird Randy you play on this show. You're all over the place. Where are you beaming in from this time? Great to be on the show this week. I'm down here in Austin, Texas. Just participated in the Formula One as well as the University of Texas football game. Unfortunately, um, we won the football game. We had to sit through massive amounts of rain in both events. So luckily in one event, I was actually in a box. So that was better. But the weather was not too good. 
And you seem to be dodging hurricanes left and right of late. You had the one threatening Puerto Rico. Now you're kind of getting uh, the remnants of that massive storm sweeping through Texas. Maybe you should consider moving some of your travel up north this time of year. <laughs> just, just before it gets really cold. Yeah, that's true. Good timing on that front as well. Uh, so, yeah, I guess you can't win either way. But at least hopefully going forward, you can maybe dial back the, the hurricane watch. They were saying that one that was sweeping through Mexico was one of the largest, most powerful storms ever on record. So certainly has been an interesting, interesting season for you guys over there from a hurricane perspective. Thankfully, we don't get a lot of those here at the Options Insider Studios here in scenic, sunny Chicago. Say what you will about the Chicago weather. At least hurricanes, not really a big factor on our radar but you know what is on our radar is a lot of the interesting data and the tools that you guys out there as the busy advisor the asset manager can use to arm yourselves really when you're thinking about adding options or more importantly want to have that conversation with your client so without further ado let's dive right on into our tricks of the trade segment and now it's time for practical tips on how to implement options into your practice it's time to learn the tricks of the trade All right, everybody, welcome to the Tricks of the Trade. Like I said previously, this is indeed the portion of the program. We break down some of the interesting tips and tricks and strategies and information that we use here uh, in the world of options uh, to help convey these products uh, to a wide variety of audiences, including to the clients. And there's a lot of data that we really can use to help us do that. And so we thought it's a good way to kick off the show uh, this month by breaking down some of that data, including some of the stuff that's just breaking as we speak, some of the most recent data. We know a lot of you guys out there in the listening audience really love to arm yourself with the latest facts and numbers. So if you're sitting down with a client and they say to you, why should I use these options things? I hear they're dangerous. Well, you're armed with some witty retorts and indeed some data uh, to back them up. Eric, unfortunately, our partner over there at the Options Industry Council on the advisor team. Couldn't make it today. He's off at another conference on the West Coast, I believe. But we're going to start things off in the Tricks of the Trade segment by breaking down some of their most recent findings. One of the reasons I love having OIC on this program is they always come armed with a lot of interesting data. They're always out there commissioning interesting studies uh, to examine different use cases and different segments of the options audience, the options user base. And they've done it again. They do regular polls out there with uh, Harris Interactive, and this latest one a study, they did their 2015 study of investors. They went from February through July, talked to about a thousand active investors across five different major options brokerage firms, the ones that attract self-directed investors. So these are essentially polls of those active kind of high end of the retail segment, which I'd imagine a lot of our listeners as in the active financial advisor space and the, and the financial asset manager space would like to attract as clients. And so they broke these down, essentially how these respondents broke down. It, they, people qualify themselves as about 622 options users, 300, about 350 or so non-options users. And this is one of the larger studies of this kind. And they said, according to the study, uh, they found that 85% of people, options users in the study, uh, a lot of interesting findings. They consider themselves to be extremely knowledgeable compared to only 66%, only two thirds <laughs> of non-investors. Again, some reasons why you might want to find these clients and make them, I think, have them be, they'd be desirable clients for anyone's, anyone's practice out there. Uh, users of listed options, indeed, much more likely than non-options users to trade and use a wide array of products and risk management tools, including ETFs, including investment trusts, ADRs, gold, and futures commodities. So no surprise there. If they're embracing of options, they're more willing to embrace other products related and indeed unrelated. Also early adopters of new products, which is good for some of the advisors out there who are trying to push the envelope from a technology perspective. The options clientele probably going to be more willing to go along with that. Also, in general, the options users are much more passionate about investing, which I think we all know as a client, you want that client who's really engaged in the process. Otherwise, you kind of seem like you're almost wasting your time a little bit. Uh, they consider themselves to be uh, investors, not savers, which is an interesting uh, distinction. Uh, more active as well, which I think is interesting for a lot of our listeners out there. More active than non-options users when trading stocks. Uh, they averaged 33 stock trades over the past year versus only 25 for non-options users, so a significant percentage more on the options end of the side. They also they've built more diversified investment portfolios, again, kind of going back to their willingness to embrace a wide variety of products. They use things, like, again, like ETFs, investment trusts, gold, futures, options, of course, 
Uh, they're more likely to increase their, their trading. They also are more likely uh, to invest in options to generate income. Again, that's a primary use case we've outlined on the show many times. Options, the way to generate income, a very, very large use case for them. I think also very interesting for our audience here, Randy, is that the study found that options users in general are more likely to have about a million dollars or more in net assets than non-options users. So again, people who want active clientele, people who are knowledgeable, who are involved in the process, and also who hopefully bring some decent assets to the table in terms of clientele. And it sounds like uh, on this front, uh, the options users really are are delivering on all those fronts. Randy, you, you speak from a practical perspective on this. You obviously interact with this clientele and in other aspects of the options clientele on a regular basis. First off, what's your take on this study in general? And then B, do you have any any issues with it? Or perhaps you, do you agree with all the findings? I mean, you obviously interact with the audience quite a bit as well. Uh, what's your take on the individual points they're highlighting here as well? Well, first of all, I think they don't surprise me at all. Um, actually, I started out in the business very similar to this. And I was an individual trader and, and, and really built this strategy and built our company over the last 20 years. So it doesn't surprise me that these guys are more active or willing to try new products, have more money. Um, just it's, it's probably the cream of the crop on how these people get built over time and what they ultimately get into in terms of how they invest and understand and build their portfolios. I think as a win-win, um, we, we always don't deal with directly with the individual users um, or the individual retail clients, but we usually mostly work through other advisors who have those end users. But we love the concept of education. That's one of the things that we do at SWAN is really spend a lot of time, energy, and effort trying to educate our clients to understand how our strategies work and when what periods our, our strategy shouldn't really um, necessarily outperform. So I think this is this 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 uh, these findings are pretty consistent with what I think in my past experience. Yeah, I think it's interesting. A lot of this reinforces what things we've already known about the options audience, but still, at the end of the day, it's always nice to have hard, concrete data. And again, about a thousand users, so that's a relatively sizable study. We've seen little bits here and there. You know, they call a handful of people or something like that. It's hard to really draw any meaningful conclusions from those. When you're seeing a thousand or so people, that's a pretty decent sample size to at least draw some. Uh, conclusions from them. We thought, since we're talking about studies now anyway, it might be a good time to look back on some of the other interesting studies uh, you out there, either as the busy asset manager, financial advisor who wants to arm yourself, as well as out there, perhaps you're looking for a new advisor or asset manager and you want to say, hey, what are some of the things I should arm myself with when I go into those conversations? Uh, we kind of did kind of a, I guess you can call it a greatest hits, Randy, if you will, of some of the other uh, better studies that have been done out there on on not just the options audience as well, but also really the, the fun space when it comes to options. A lot of you guys out there want to know uh, what are some fun-based products. Again, that's why we have Randy on the show. They obviously are very active in that side of the space uh, in terms of what funds utilize options, how do they utilize them, what does it bring to the table if you're thinking about incorporating them into your portfolio. Uh, so a lot of other good studies on this front. We haven't mentioned this one before on the show. Uh, of course, the probably the gold standard recently, before we even get to that one I was about to talk to, uh, the gold standard is really uh, the paper recently coming out of uh, with Keith Black, Edward Sato. They were, of course, on the program recently. If you missed that, listeners, check out episode 28 from February this year, where we had them on to discuss their study in length. It was essentially the performance of analysis, performance analysis, excuse me, of options-based equity mutual funds, CEFs, and ETFs. We really broke down a lot of great data on that one. Again, if you haven't heard that episode, go check it out. If you really want to arm yourself to a lot of great data as to what what these products can bring to you as an asset manager, fund manager, and also hear from the study's author themselves, kind of their viewpoints on the study and their findings. It was pretty interesting stuff. Uh, so we hit on that that one quite a bit. We won't go too much into extra detail on that, but there were some other studies floating around I did want to mention here. We haven't mentioned on the program before uh, a study by Goldman back in 2014, so a little over a year old or so now, but still relevant to a lot of our users. They studied mutual fund use of options. Again, near and dear to a lot of our hearts, including, I know, yours, Randy. And they had a lot of interesting findings there. They found back, of course, this is by middle or so of 2014, uh, so it has evolved a little bit since then, but still 
they found five of the top 15 fund families now have funds that utilize options in some capacity. Uh, and in general, I think a lion's share of those would be probably income generation, maybe a little bit of hedging, uh, but still five of the top 15. So if you look hard, you can find uh, funds out there that do utilize options in some capacity, uh, at least in terms of number of funds, at least almost 200 funds uh, using f- options. And of those, they had about nearly half a, half a billion dollars, excuse me, half a trillion dollars in assets under management at the end of 2013 against the 2014 studies. That number has grown a little bit or so since then. In terms of strategies, a percentage of positions held by mutual funds in each option strategies, again, like I said, about two-thirds in short calls to generate income. A quarter, this surprises me, a quarter in short puts and 8% in long puts, so and 6% in long calls. So if you think of yourself as the primary use case for options only being income generation on the call side and then hedging on the put side, kind of interesting to see almost a quarter of those funds out there writing puts instead of buying puts, which is kind of interesting, and 6%, a very small number out there, actually. Probably almost the same percentage buying puts as in buying calls. I think that's kind of interesting and worth sinking our teeth into a little bit. And of course, as we said with other studies, over the five-year period ending uh, about March of 2014 when they did this study, uh, the funds that use options had higher returns, lower volatility, higher risk-adjusted returns than their peer funds. So pretty much all the things you want to see out of an options fund Obviously, Randy, this is near and dear to your heart. You guys run uh, your own swan funds. You have the mutual funds. So you're very active in this space. Uh, what's your take on this study, as well as their findings that, uh, that kind of surprised me about a quarter of the funds out there actually out there writing puts, uh, far more than people who are actually buying premium in any way, shape, or form? Did that surprise you, or is that kind of what you expected? It, well, no, actually, it surprised me. It was only 22. I mean, 22% seems like a high number. I was more surprised by only 8% that are using long puts in their strategy. I mean, I guess I, I guess I always think of, you know, the classic option trade is, is buying an underlying selling a covered call and buying some put protection. But based on these numbers, you know, our, our strategy, our fund is, is probably a big percentage of that 8% at that point. So that, that's, that's a little, you know, we do get a lot of questions about our strategy and who else is doing what we're doing, something similar. So um, I, the 8%, was a little low, a little low for me. Yeah, I guess if you take Swan out of that equation, it's probably like one percent, really. <laughs> you guys are you guys account for the lion's share of put buying out there in the marketplace from a fund perspective. Interesting and perhaps a little bit disturbing as well, Randy. Absolutely. Um, I mean, the big picture though is I like that there's more mutual funds with options out there. I think it's absolutely you know a viable strategy. I think it's going to get bigger, more more people, more firms in that space and. And it will show its uh, true value over the next market correction. It's always really, you know, more difficult to have a hedge strategy in bear market or bull markets. But, uh, but finally, over the long haul, our value proposition is always that we think the right combination of upside and downside market capture ratio really determines whether or not you outperform your benchmarks over time. But uh, the the industry, you know, as we all know, since the 2008-9 sell-off has 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 shifted assets, people using alternative strategies mostly because the the premise was that asset allocation or modern portfolio theory really didn't provide the risk protection that it was supposed to, that everyone kind of counted on. And I think that's why you're seeing the the increase in the number of funds that use options and the hedging techniques they employ has grown up, has grown considerably. Obviously, with the education, the OIC also does and everything else, the radio shows that we're on all point to that same, that same growth. Yeah, I think the old uh, Cap M model. Uh, I think if you follow that these days, you have to be in what is it, forty plus different <laughs> underlyings at this point to really uh, achieve that "quote unquote" true diversification. Yeah, th- this these findings I think were a little bit uh, interesting and or disturbing to me. You're right because you guys have always operated in essentially that overlay mode, at least for the primary uh, Swan defined risk management approach. Where of course you buy the puts to hedge, you sell the put, of course, as well as a spread uh, to help mitigate some of the cost of that. And then of course you're writing the call against the long underlying. And you know, I can see the use case for a lot of these funds they become savvy to options and they want to use them instead of a limit buy order they're writing puts that's a certainly a reasonable use case i just kind of get a little bit concerned when i see such a large percentage are out there just writing puts uh, because you have already a large universe of funds that are essentially just long only equity that aren't using options at all that are riding the market up and riding the market down now add into them a, a decent percentage of people who are out there just writing puts and it could make a downturn in the market uh Somewhat painful for a lot of these funds out there. But that said, interesting stuff. Wouldn't mind seeing a little bit more of a bump in that long put side of the fence, but I think we'll get there 
over time, people start seeing what guys like you, Randy, and your firm and others are doing, maybe perhaps uh, they'll, they'll awaken to the benefits of doing just that. Speaking of benefits, another paper you guys might want to check out here. This one comes from uh, some professors of the University of Augsburg. Uh, it was called The Benefits of Options Use by Mutual Funds. This one more recent, 2015, and kind of hitting on some of the same points we had again. Again, it's always nice to have multiple peer-reviewed. In this case, these are outside. These are not commissioned by the OIC or anything like that. These are just outside studies that have been done looking at the use case of options. And again, they kind of fi had findings that were similar and, con and really uh, supported a lot of the other findings we've seen from studies here. Use of options by mutual funds yields a higher risk-adjusted performance compared with non-option using funds. Uh, option using funds show significantly lower systemic risk because they use options mainly for hedging strategies and not for speculation. Uh, I think some of those numbers you saw from the other study may, may, may dispute that a little bit, but we can get to that another day. Uh, also, Consistent with covered call strategies for income generation, they saw that mutual fund short positions are the main drivers of the performance enhancing effect. Again, getting to that writing covered calls for income really being a, a key generator in the outperformance of a lot of these funds. And of course, the protective put side strategies accounting for the hedging benefits out there from a lot of these funds in terms of a reducing volatility, reducing the drawdowns of your portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. So there's really three to four, actually four good studies on funds, as well as, of course, uh, the Harris study to really give you some more demographic breakdown data. If you want to find all these, of course, you could find the Harris study at optionseducation.org. Click on the advisor tab there and search for the others at other places. Of course, you can find the, the paper by uh, Keith Black at Zotto on our site, and of course the episode we did all about it. Uh, the Goldman Sachs paper, we'll try to link to all these in the show notes as well. You can find them to search for these different terms we gave you here and some of the titles of these of these funds and you or excuse me, of these studies, you could find them yourself directly. But still a lot of data out there. Randy, before we conclude the tricks of the trade segment, in addition to these studies, are there any other studies or any other data you found handy when out there talking about your fund to new investors and things that you want to share with our listeners here before we wrap up this segment? Well, I think these studies and the studies that we've mentioned in the past shows about color of the cubes and the subsequent studies, we use those all the time. Um, you know, you can do all the research that you want when you have independent people doing it, but quite frankly, we don't only know these people. Um, it's always great for the industry. It's great for what we're trying to do. Uh, you know, we, we really approach the, uh, the whole kind of risk management perspective of, you know, how do strategies such as ours perform? How do we build and add value to a portfolio? So, Typically, the value proposition for, for Swan is always, okay, we know you have a portfolio design like this. Um, you know, what will a hedge strategy do um, to your strategy in terms of generating returns that are non-correlated and provide some absolute downside protection? So that's kind of a, a lot of analysis that we end up doing. But um, it is, the conclusions are very similar to what these, the, all these studies have concluded. And again, if you want more information on any of these studies, check out the show notes in the podcast here or on our website, theoptionsider.com. We'll have links to all of these studies for you. And of course, the OIC folks have links to a lot of them over there as well. All right, and that's going to do it for the tricks of the trade. And now, because we know you guys don't have time to keep up on all the latest developments in the space, we like to do it for you here in the program in a little segment we like to call The Buzz. Busy financial advisors don't have time to follow the latest developments from the options market. So we do it for you. It's time to get the buzz. All right, everybody. Welcome to the buzz. This is the portion of the show. We break down some of the latest developments in the world of options uh, that are relevant to you guys out there in the asset management financial advisor world. You guys may recall, and Randy, certainly you recall, we've uh, talked a lot of late about the uh, Department of Labor's fiduciary uh, proposal and their conflict of interest exemption. We had Joe Corcoran, the legal counsel to the OIC, on uh, to discuss that issue at length. It really seemed like in this somewhat apparently on the surface minute change in the language uh, to this exemption really could potentially have very, very dire consequences for the options industry as a whole, and particularly for the listeners of this program, people who are active in retirement accounts using options, because that seemed to be the primary target. If that language went through unchanged, essentially it would ban or prohibit the use of options in retirement accounts, which, as we just said, and looking at the studies and data, is a huge use case for options these days, and also on a, on a general ADB basis, 
somewhere around 15% of, of average daily volume in the option space can be direct, directly traced back to IRAs and options use in IRAs for income generation, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be a huge blow to the industry, a huge blow specifically to the listeners of this program. A lot of people in the industry really gathered together to push back against that. We encouraged our listeners to write their own comment letters. Uh, that comment period is now closed. But it seems like, Randy, it seems like, I put that you know out there intentionally vague, but it does seem like the, that tsunami of criticism against that, particularly that that uh, that conflict of interest exemption there really seemed to hopefully do the trick. Uh, the Department of Labor has since come out, and a lot of different members of it have commented publicly that it seems like perhaps uh, there, a fix is in the works. Uh, we had comments recently, uh, earlier, a few months ago, uh, from one of the... Uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Program Operations in the Department of Labor, he said that they're open to reworking the controversial fiduciary proposal. Uh, he came on and said, we've identified what we believe are demonstrable injuries that flow from the current confirmation structure, compensation structure, excuse me, the current way advice is delivered to retirement. We're committed to doing something to fix that problem. Uh, he admitted or, that the agency would approach the rulemaking process with an open mind. Uh, there will be changes to this exemption proposal, no doubt about it. This is also echoed by the Secretary of Labor, Thomas Perez, uh, who said that they w- they're going to make changes as long as they don't lose sight of the North Star, which is enforcing these best interest commitment. We are very flexible on the question of how the work will get done. And uh, even more recently, just this past week, uh, we saw Phyllis Borzi. She's the main architect uh, of this rule here at the Department of Labor. Uh, she said that the DOL was still waiting through the comment letters. They got quite a few of them, Randy, uh, that poured in during the plan's six-month comment period. Uh, She expects a final rule to be out in the first half uh, of 2016. She said, we're trying desperately to get through the rest of the comments. Uh, So uh, she said the goal in amending the rule was to simplify and streamline the process. And they found nuggets of, quote, good ideas on how to change the much maligned best interest contract exemption, as well as for comments explaining the rule, the type of investments that should be subject to the rule. So those latter two comments, Randy, sound like they are specifically in regard to this issue we've been talking about here, where that language, either maliciously or probably more likely due to an oversight, essentially would ban the use of options. It seems like they've it seems like they've gotten that message loud and clear over there at the DOL, and I wouldn't be surprised to see whatever this revised rule that comes through in early 2016, uh, it doesn't have that language anymore. Is that kind of your takeaway from this as well, Randy? Are you still maybe perhaps a little bit cynical about this whole process? Well, most of the time when the government gets involved, I'm always a little cynical because they, they have a noble goal of trying to uh, protect uh, people in general as it relates to this um, investors to not be taken advantage of. But of course, sometimes the unintended consequences cause more problems than what they were trying to fix. So the good news is it sounds like they're taking this very slow. They've waited for a comment period. They've got a lot of feedback and, and we'll see what comes out. But no, I think this is probably true because I probably always believed all along this is more of an oversight um, than, than, a, than a, an actual attempt to try to limit as it relates to the options, people from using options in an IRA, which we, of course, all believe is a great risk management tool. Yeah, of course, we haven't seen the final language, and they could, in attempting to remedy that earlier error, make another error and cause issues. You're right. There always are unintended consequences to all of these things, but still – uh, kind of interesting, nonetheless, that it seems like on the surface that appears they, like they've gotten the message, which is a good thing. seems like the, the industry once in a while can get together to affect some good change instead of just sniping at each other all the time. And this could perhaps be one of those examples. So if you were one of those ones who listened to some of those earlier episodes and were rightfully concerned, uh, Joe painted a very dire picture when he was on the program a few months ago. Hopefully you can exhale a little bit now and you could continue using options in your IRAs as you always have, and that won't change any time in the near future. Uh, speaking of, we're talking about the government side of the, of the fence and how they like to meddle with the markets, Randy. It seems like of late, certainly since the last time uh, we did the program, Randy, it seems like once again, you know, this, this concept gets floated around quite a bit. Uh, this is not specific to options, but it certainly will impact this marketplace as well. Uh, this concept of uh, taxing transactions comes back into into favor, and it seems like all of a sudden the pendulum has swung back into favor. First off, we have uh, Senator Bernie Sanders. Uh, he has this proposal to tax stock trades at a half of a percent of the value of a transaction and 0.1 percent for bonds, 0.005 percent for derivatives. I don't know how they how they arrive at these numbers, but still, those are percentages he wants to tax, and he doesn't want 
to, uh, of course, impact the small investor. So he wants to give them some sort of uh, rebate on their taxes, et cetera, et cetera. And that kind of stuff floats around. That gets bandied about. Usually doesn't get any momentum behind it, Randy. But then we also saw kind of joining this chorus a little bit of a different spin on it, but the same underlying message at the end of the day. Uh, we recently saw Hillary Clinton here in the U.S. presidential election uh, Diving into this taxing the markets, in particular, particular going after the HFT crowd, was some surprisingly specific comments. It's not the kind of thing you usually hear from a candidate out there stumping on the trail. Uh, she says she wants to come out and impose a tax on high-frequency trading because it has, quote, unnecessarily burdened our markets and enabled unfair and abusive trading strategies that often capitalize on a two-tiered market structure with obsolete rules. And she particularly focused on strategies involving excessive levels of order cancellations with make our, make our markets less stable and less fair. Again, that's Focused on the HFT side of the fence, but Randy, you and I have been around long enough to know now that when, when people start coming after one segment of the market, that eventually spills over into other segments, particularly when it's something as nebulous as HFT. I mean, we were just joking before, you, you account for probably the lion's share over that swan of those puts being purchased in that study. So who knows? You guys could be labeled as a high-frequency trader, depending on the volume and the number of times you guys are, are out there. And you're certainly not out there gaming the latency of the marketplace. So these definitions become very broad, and they get to apply to a lot of people that they probably don't really, it, the definition really doesn't apply to at the end of the day. So we kind of take all of these things with a bit of a a bit of a, a bit of a warning, and it certainly seems like the winds are starting to blow again, Randy, in terms of favor in the, on the hill for some sort of traxing, a taxing of transactions, which I think you and I both know, we've seen demonstrable examples of this in the past, that any sort of tax, however noble-spirited it may be, is always going to bleed down to the end user at the end of the day. It's going to cause our listeners, the advisors, to have to pass more free fees through to their customers and clients. It's going to widen out spreads and really hurt the market. Uh, I'm curious, Randy, I know you're kind of cynical about this stuff anyway to begin with. Uh, do you think perhaps we're, we're heading for a new era where uh, some of these populist measures to tax, quote-unquote, Wall Street are really going to start hitting this industry and perhaps hurting the markets that we use a lot, particularly in the options world where spreads are already a bit of an issue and now we see these taxes go through, it could really be a demonstrably negative thing for this marketplace. Well, I'm cautiously optimistic that they're not going to do something like that. If I'm just going to be looking at the political landscape, I don't think anything's going to happen until at least after the election. I think most of this is posturing, um, you know, to try to, to have Hillary Clinton try to get the nomination and, and out liberal Bernie Sanders. I'm not sure that's really possible, but it sounds to me like that's what she's doing. Of course, I'm always skeptical, just as like we talked about in terms of the whole option with respect to IRAs. Whenever you do something, you usually have unintended consequences, and and uh, it usually ends up hurting the guys that you're not really intending to hurt. And I figure the high frequency traders would find a way to get around something anyway. So I'm not sure they can really accomplish anything what they're trying to do. And in longer term. You know, I'm always a little skeptical also of other politicians who really aren't investors, who aren't traders, notwithstanding the cattle features, uh, apparently 20 or 30 years ago for Hillary Clinton to, uh, she, she, she doesn't know, she's, uh, she doesn't have a lot of experience in this kind of market. So that's a little scary. But like I said, I think we're years away from something like this happening. That's right. I forgot she is a cattle futures whiz. So maybe we should rely on her expertise. Uh, she had a very, very, uh, very successful 24-hour period or five-hour period, whatever it was, in the cattle futures market. All right, turning our attention away from the government back towards uh, some more breaking news that is a little bit more near and dear to the world of options. Uh, we'll close out this segment with this one. Uh, Randy, I know you've paid attention to uh, what the SIBO has done in the past with their buy right index. It's kind of been an interesting product. It was a great way to try to codify this use case we talked about a lot on this program, which is people using options to try to generate income, particularly on broad-based portfolios like the S&P. So what did the SIBO do? They put together uh, this BXM, this buy right index, that essentially writes at the money covered calls on the S SPX product uh, every month and takes that income, puts it into the product. It's been a bit of a success. We've seen a lot of other linked products spinning off of the BXM. Uh, but people who use it, there, I, I, there's a chorus of issues people have with the product, not the least of which that it's writing at the money covered calls. Most people don't choose to write that. Usually they try to write 
a little bit out of the money or somewhere along those ranges to give themselves a little bit of income and perhaps appreciation as well with the underlying. So people had issue with that. They had issue with kind of just the uh, the rigorous nature of the approach as well as the underlying, you know, the SPX, the options they were using uh, were not, not the product of choice for a lot of, particularly uh, on the retail clientele aspect side. Uh, they really don't use SPX. They tend to prefer SPY. It's smaller. It's very liquid, easier for them to bite off. So we've seen an interesting new foray into this buy right index world. Uh, Randy, coming out of NYSE this time, and of course, ICE, their parent company, uh, they have launched what they're calling NYBW. This is their own new buy right index, what they're calling a smart beta solution for investors wishing to access uh, the buy right strategy. And essentially, it attempts to address those few shortcomings I just mentioned. First off, it migrates the product to SPY away from SPX, of course, away from a SIBO proprietary product too. No doubt that was one of the reasons behind it. Uh, it, all, it also writes SPY weekly options, something else I didn't mention. Uh, people want to get farther into uh, the short duration portion of the curve writing weeklies as opposed to monthlies. This product will do just that. And of course, they mentioned here, weeklies have become a much bigger hit since BXM was originally created. And of course, uh, they also trying to use a little bit of market timing in here, very, very modest amount. If you're crossing 50 day or 200 day moving averages, that will input whether they decide to write essentially a 2% out of the money call or uh, even a uh, sometimes a, uh, a little bit in the money call uh, on this uh, on this interest on this index. Excuse me. So there's a little bit of market timing involved in this too, which is probably good or bad depending on your viewpoint. But still, it's kind of nice to see a more competitors in this space aside from just that SIBO product, which has been out there for a long time. And also B, I think Randy, I think you'll agree, the more products that are out there helping to beat the drum for even something as simple as a buy right, a covered call, uh, you know, that helps kind of lift all boats, gets more education out there, gets more people interested in this, and then they can go out and say, okay, I've tried this. Now let me see what a more involved version of this strategy looks like and then maybe they find their way over to a place like swan for example so so what's your take on this new product and indeed the ever-growing world of of buy right type indexes out there randy well i've always said i like the more products the better giving giving consumers and investors more choices i think is always a better thing um, I'm, I'm obviously that's not my first choice would be doing a buy right as a product, but uh, I like the building blocks that you're gonna that you're gonna start off with because quite frankly, when most people start trading options for the first time, a covered call strategy is probably what they do. Probably move on to to more exotic types of strategies with various spreads and collars and stuff like that. So. I think that I think from that perspective, I like it a lot, and I think that uh, it'd be interesting to see how their their timing plays out in terms of the 50, 50 and two hundred day moving averages. I I, I kind of like the creativity. It's always difficult though to have something that's so rules based that uh, it's very easy to replicate. I think they're over the long haul. Hopefully, each one of these firms can can create new products that have more exotic twists to what they're trying to do. Take advantage of of, of the market environments. Yeah, I like to see these types of efforts coming out of the exchanges because it is kind of a stagnant place a lot of times in terms of innovation. Here are some clear and demonstrable improvements you can make to this original product. And you're right, you know, the, the buy right at the end of the day is kind of like that gateway drug for the options world for a lot of the retail clients as well as the advisors and asset managers out there. That's how they first come into options looking to generate income. And then once they do that for a little while, they start to realize the pluses and indeed the shortcomings of that strategy. And that's when they, of course, graduate to the next level. They start looking at perhaps adding a hedging component. They start playing with the term and the structure and the products, et cetera. And then it becomes a much more involved thing. And again, they start looking at products like, like yours and others out there, Randy, that do a much more involved overlay strategy. And it, but it all starts frequently with that buy right, which is why I like to see more efforts in that space to make that that product more approachable, uh, more manageable, and easier to understand for a lot of people out there. Maybe the timing component, you can take issue with that if you like, but uh, overall, more products in that space and more big muscle out there pushing that approach, I think, is a good thing for everybody. So if you're looking for an, an interesting kind of uh, entry-level product for you out there, listeners, maybe this NYBW is the right product for you. All right, and that's going to do it for our The Buzz segment. Now, without further ado... Let's dive right on into your questions for us here on the program and open up our office hours. 
It's time to answer your pressing questions about options. It's time to start our office hours. You can become a part of this segment by leaving a question on theoptionsinsider.com, emailing us at questions at theoptionsinsider.com, or via social media at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or stocktwits.com slash optionsinsider. All right, everybody, welcome to the Office Hours. Randy, we do this show only once a month, so the mail tends to pile up. <laughs> I like to get to as much of it as possible uh, on each episode. So without further ado, let's dive right in. This first one comes from Nick. Nick L., he writes, uh, interesting stuff, hard to believe. Uh, what major changes do you expect in the options market in 2035? And what he's referring to here, Randy, is a recent tweet that the, the our friends over there at OIC Advisor made. They tweeted out, uh, that this is earlier this week, I believe, uh, the average, da- or maybe last week, average daily volume in 1995 was 1.1 million contracts, an amount surpassed today, which was last week, listeners, in the first 30 minutes uh, of trading. So Nick L. writing here that that is indeed interesting stuff and hard for him to believe, and he wants to know, what other changes do we expect in this same time frame, 20 years in the future? Uh, from an options perspective, this, of course, going back to 1995, that data and that original tweet. Uh, this is an interesting one, Randy. I, I first saw that tweet. I kind of made note of it myself and kind of chuckled and said, wow, how far we have come uh, from an options market perspective, the notion that we could do in the first 30 minutes of the day what used to be the, essentially the entire day's worth of volume. It shows how this product has evolved. This marketplace has evolved. The number of classes and names being traded in the options world have evolved just exponentially over the past 20 years. And, and certainly since my time in the options world and indeed in yours, it has evolved just on a meteoric pace in the last decade, even the last five years. We've seen a lot of change and a lot of developments on the volume side. Overall, volume has kind of uh, seems like have ebbed and flowed over the past couple of years now, of course, with the big uh, developments in the marketplace being a big driver of that. seems like this year, may indeed be on track again after some good months uh, a few months ago to perhaps surpass 2014 from a volume perspective. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, But still, interesting stuff. But it opens us up, Randy. I'll give you pride of place on this one to what we think is coming, you know, 20 years from now. what What do you see happening in terms of volume? What other major, perhaps, developments do you see in the world of options in 2035? What's your put on your put on your your Karnak hat here, Randy? And what do you see for the future? Well, in terms of volume, I don't think I could really throw out a meaningful number. I mean, I guess I could take some Excel and use some Excel functions to extrapolate where we'd be. But uh, I think the bigger issue is is that that the acceptance of options in the investment community has grown tremendously. I think that's going to continue. And the reason why I think it's going to continue is due to the failures of modern portfolio theory to actually deliver in 2008 and nine. Obviously, I think there's going to be other bear markets coming up. In fact, I can make a pretty compelling argument that uh, the government has kind of, uh, you know, pushed things down the road and eventually it's going to all kind of settle out uh, with the low interest environment we're in right now, which is obviously a direct result of what the government has done. Um, It's really put more pressure on money managers to find creative strategies to generate not only other strategies that can generate and replace what fixed income can't really do, but to do it in a different way, right? So we could take two asset streams that generate, let's say maybe that's you know seven percent per year, um, but but in the investment community, seven percent a year is not the same as a different seven percent. You got to measure it by different risk measures like standard deviation and things like the pain index and stuff like that. The other thing is is how you incur those 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 revenue streams actually occur. So. At the end of the day, finding diversified assets, everyone loves the concept of diversification, but is it really hard or how hard is it to find assets that are truly diversified? So that's why I think the options are going to be used more because we always use in our, our kind of presentations that using options to hedge is a direct um, – it's a it's an asset that it's non-correlated to the underlying asset if you're trying to hedge it with using a put. So we think those are those are better ways to protect. So – as I said, I think for those three reasons, I think we're going to have a tremendous amount, tremendous amount of growth over the next decades. That being said, I think within that, there's going to be wet ebbs and flows of how much volume and volatility that occur as you go through the market cycle. So, you know, clearly, if we were going through a massive 20-year bull market, people probably wouldn't even care about options. Um, but, but, but 
everyone knows at the end of the day that bear markets cannot be repealed, and they're 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 with us with us to stay for a while. Well said, sir. I don't take issue with any of that. I think it's clearly, you know, demonstrable. Twenty years from now, the volume will probably have increased dramatically. It'll probably be something similar to this. Maybe where it'll be some fraction of the trading day, and we'll look back and say, "Oh, look how how little volume we did twenty years ago as compared to today." We do that now in two hours or whatever the case may be. So it certainly probably be something along those lines. Uh, I, I kind of agree there. Uh, also, I think interesting. Uh, the market structure, the exchanges and things, I, I could comment on that, but I think we have another question about that coming up specifically, so I think I'll, I'll reserve that for that question. Uh, but in terms of, I think what's interesting to me too, Randy, maybe because I'm a bit of a technophile, is, is to see what kind of what kind of technology we'll be using to access the, the options market in 2035. It sounds like such a futuristic date. It's only 20 years in the future. But we're already at this point, Randy, just in the past decade or two, we've seen you know uh, options liquidity migrate away from the trading floor, places like how I got into the business through through the options trading pits no longer really viable any longer. The vast majority of the liquidity going up electronically now. You can just hit a button on your computer, even on your tablet, smartphone. We've already got now apps for the iWatch and other smartwatches. You can actually trade options from your wrist now. So what evolution that will take in 20 years, that will be amazing to see. It'll probably be embedded into our chips in our brains, Randy, and we'll just we'll just think about selling uh, you know, a covered call and it will execute the trade for us. So I think that might be the interesting part of it. And of course, as that happens, uh, volume will grow. And also as these other markets come online, you know, China is just in the nascent stages of embracing listed options. They launched their first real contract in February of this year. So that's you're talking a billion plus people waiting to come online uh, to this product. When that happens, the floodgates in terms of volume are just going to explode. Same thing with India. India has been more knee deep in the options game for a while, but still a nascent marketplace from an overall options volume perspective. So when these major marketplaces come on board as well as the technology continues to evolve, I wouldn't be surprised to see these numbers become laughable again in, in 20 years from now. Good, good question, Nick, and a good tweet from the OIC folks. Uh, moving on, another question. Uh, this comes from Todd, Todd B., who's a, who's a CFA. He writes, hey, this question is for the Advisors Option Radio Program. Well, he sent it to the right place, Todd. He goes on to write, hey, what is the best way to discuss volatility with new potential clients? Should I highlight it as an opportunity for income generation, highlight the benefits of options to reduce portfolio volatility, or simply stare clear of it altogether? Uh, well, Randy, uh, Mike it couldn't make it today, and of course, Eric couldn't make it. So as the only one here with any clients, <laughs> you get to have this one all to yourself here, uh, Randy. What's your approach when you're out there talking about your funds and things? Do you do you get into what some may view as the volatility quagmire, or do you try to avoid it? You know, What's your approach out here? Todd really wants to know. I'm sure a lot of our listeners do as well. Well, when I read the entire question, um, my answer, and, and what he says is, should I highlight the income generation or highlight the benefits to be able to reduce volatility? I mean, fundamentally, it's both at the end of the day. Now, we always start off discussing um, our strategies at SWAN in terms of hedging the downside of the underlying asset, let's say the S&P 500 or other assets like emerging markets or gold or whatever. So we always use the concept of insurance and uh, in terms of how you, you hedge your life, every aspect of your life, whether it's, you know, your life, your auto, your, your, uh, your health, et cetera, you're usually using options, which is a derivative obviously. And so, so, so we don't steer clear of it. I, I don't think clients ultimately are, are, are benefited by not discussing that. Now that doesn't mean that when you get in the initial conversations, you're getting a deep complex subjects within that volatility, but yeah, you have to be able to approach it by saying, Fundamentally, you want to adopt a hedge strategy because it's going to provide some protection if things don't go well in the markets. And we know that most of the markets kind of train together when they're, when you really need them not to trade together. The correlations typically go closer to one as, as we experienced in 2008-9. So, so I think the bigger the way to approach it initially is, is the protection to the portfolio. Secondarily, it would be the variation of income streams. When you enter the options market, you're able to adjust the payoff structure of certain investments. And I think that's valuable, especially in light of the fixed income environment we're in right now. A sensible approach. You probably don't want to overwhelm them with things like, you know, the VIX futures term structure or implied versus realized volatility. You can you can save that for another day if they are indeed uh, prepared for that conversation. But it sounds like from what you're saying, Randy, and I certainly agree that, you know, highlighting the benefits and the use cases for it certainly makes a lot of sense, particularly when volatility, you can't really escape it. It's out there in the media. They're talking about things like VIX on a regular basis on places like CNBC. So they're probably going to be coming to you asking you 
questions about it. If you try to avoid it, it probably will end up uh, causing more questions that you don't want to answer. So uh, yeah, I think I think that approach makes a lot of sense. All right, moving on. We got a question here from seven seven seven. He or she writes, "Hey, does the panel see the possibility of options exchange mergers anytime soon?" Seems like there are just too many right now, and it needlessly needlessly complicates trading. Uh, this is that question I was alluding to earlier, specifically about the, the market structure here and options. Uh, this is kind of a question we get a lot. I haven't had it for this show before, but still an interesting one nonetheless. Um, this is a this is an issue I think I and a lot of people have. In fact, you guys, if you've listened to our content for any time, listeners, you know we do a lot of content from the big options industry conference every year. Uh, we we had Randy on the program from uh, Miami this year, so we do a lot down there. We talk to the different exchanges and others, and we're we're very much involved in that side of the options market. And to see more and more exchanges coming online all the time. In fact, Bats has their second options exchange due to come online any time now in the next couple of weeks. So that will bring us from. 12 to 13 exchanges and ISE is planning to launch their third exchange. They have to get their finalized approval and everything else in a row. So probably sometime in Q1 of next year. So you're talking by, by summer of next year, if not earlier, we're going to have 14 listed options exchanges here in the U S with the exception of pretty much the SIBO, all of them trading the exact same products. Uh, you may ask yourself, why is that? What is the use case for it? There's a lot of reasons behind the scenes uh, that go into that. Suffice it to say, the SEC won't allow one venue to charge multiple prices for the same product. So as a result, if they want to have different fee structures, rebates, et cetera, pay someone to open here, charge someone to open here or close here, uh, they have to have multiple exchange medallions essentially to do that exact thing, which is why we have this weird obfuscated structure that we've created with multiple one exchange essentially having multiple mini exchanges within it which is very confusing and you're right it does complicate things you've seen all the meltdowns we've seen of the exchanges of late the cost the risk of connecting to all these various platforms is becoming onerous and indeed adding a layer of risk uh, to the marketplace on the plus side so many other exchanges when one of them or two of them goes down the other ones can pick up the slack. That's the one benefit to it. But on the on the plus side, or on the negative side, I should really say the costs really seem to be outweighing and the risks really seem to be outweighing any benefit to this point. So I'm kind of with you here, 777. I do hope to see some sort of consolidation. And that's actually against my best interest. Selfishly, I want to have to be 100 exchanges out there because they're all competing for sponsorship venues on a place like mine. So they're out there, the more the merrier from my core business. But at the end of the day, I know that too many of these venues, I think we're getting into that point now, too many of these venues starts to really hurt the marketplace. And so hopefully we'll get to 14 in the next six months or so. Hopefully sometime in the next couple of years, we'll start to hit the other side of that slope and start to see consolidation. So hopefully nothing soon, but it's hopefully sometime in the next couple of years, we'll maybe start seeing that. Randy, what's your opinion, A, on just the proliferation of trading venues out there does it really impact you guys out there fragmenting liquidity make it harder for you to get your trades off and then be the prospects for uh, some mergers on that front in the near future well first of all for our, our flagship product we trade mostly spx and that's all us obviously right now only in the cboe so um, the benefit of having more competition it doesn't really exist in that product but some of our other products that we do the strategy on Absolutely, it would benefit us if there's more competition, but I agree. They have to overcome the cost and make sure that it's a seamless and efficient way to execute trades. Um, I don't, you know, I think the market ultimately determines how many exchanges are needed. Um, and, and I think that, you know, I, I, I trust in that the market to ultimately work over, over the long haul. So we'll just have to wait and see. And I understand why you use SPX. Obviously, it's a much bigger notional contract. It's much more suitable for an institutional use case like yours, Randy. I'm curious, have you guys evaluated SPY at all? And is it just uh, too fragmented, too hard to get the size off you need? Is there any point where you might consider adding SPY to the mix or maybe even replacing SPX down the road? Well, we do use SPY, especially on our IRA accounts, because obviously you, you have to sell covered options. So we, we use both, actually. Um, and in fact, some of our smaller retail ac accounts, we, we do use SPY. I mean, we've talked about this in past shows. The benefits of the SPX is that you've got the 1256 contract treatment. I mean, 60% long-term capital gains, 40% short-term. Um, so I think, no, we're, we're always going to use both. Um, um, so fundamentally, I think there's a place for both of those in the market. But if I was trading one thing for a large account, I would stick with the SPX at the end of the day. I mean, obviously the other negative about using SPY versus the tax, you know, as compared to the tax treatment is obviously you have to sell more options, it's 10 to one, and that means there's more commission. And so most of the commission structures that we deal with is based on the number of contracts you sell, 
not about the notional value of the portfolio. So that's another aspect to uh, which options you trade. Yeah, be interesting to see how that impacts that NYSE uh, buy right product going forward. I think we've got time for one more here. This comes from, from Genus P. He or she writes, hey, would you counsel managers to focus their income generation in the weekly options? Short duration products appear to do well for generating income. Good question, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Genus P. In fact, we were just talking about this with the NYSE product. They're, one of their ways they're adopting the buy right index is to add the weekly option component to it. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Just about every study you see uh, comparing the amount of income generation and the theta curves out there, uh, when they com- when they get shorter and they get closer to that nearly exponential portion of the curve, in uh, terms of theta decay, they tend to do better. So if you're writing a once-a-year call, set it and forget it kind of thing, you're not going to do as well as some guy who's writing two calls a year versus some guy who's writing you know quarterly versus some guy who's writing monthly. And most data tends to back up the fact that the weekly tend to do better. There are some issues that could crop up there, not the least of which for our audience being the time involved in doing that. You're writing four contracts a month versus one. That may be off-putting to a lot of the busier managers we have out there who don't want to have that much busy work. So there may be a time versus return uh, kind of trade-off you have to weigh there. But in general, for the most part, migrating to the weeklies will benefit you over the over the long term uh, and it'll be interesting to see how that affects the NYSE product as well but again I think the the time issue is probably the biggest pushback a lot of advisors a lot of them already are in the quarterly if not you know semi-annual camp just because they don't want to deal with it uh, again I'm not a big fan of that approach I think you should maximize returns on behalf of your client but that said if you can't leverage your time appropriately maybe monthly is probably the best way to go uh, but still, uh, weeklies, if you can do it, and if you can do it in an appropriate risk-managed fashion and understand all the things you're doing there and write the, choose the right strikes, again, every week you have to choose a new strike, so there's a lot of work there. But if you can do it, I think it works. Randy, obviously you guys don't play as much in the weeklies. You play in much longer-term uh, products. But still, what are your thoughts on managers turning to the weeklies as opposed to monthlies for income generation? Well, I think I would just echo your points. I mean, it, it comes back down to, you know, what's best for your clients and, and what, you know, it, it, it is an assumption that you say you, you, you can make more money in the weeklies, but, uh, you know, I think when you deal with, when you're dealing with trading with a smaller group of individuals, you have more flexibility to go into things like weeklies. I think when you're dealing with big groups of people that have to be explained in the process and, and follow what we're doing, it, it you know, you're always kind of get, you always put yourself in somewhat of a box and say, this is our strategy. This is how we implement it. But we obviously do do option trades over many different time periods. Um, but, but uh, we, at this point, we don't, we don't use weeklies in any significant way. No, you're right. It is an assumption that the weeklies can outperform. That, that's based on a lot of data and also, you know, how theta decay works. But still, when you get into that final week with the weeklies, they live entirely in that final week. Theta gets to be a little bit of a funky prospect, particularly when you're looking out of the money versus at the money, et cetera. And I have seen a couple studies that do try to refute that a little bit and say sometimes some other issues with the weeklies could overwhelm. And, of course, you have commissions as well. So it, it is still a bit of a fluid concept. But most of the data I've seen pretty much uh, backs up the fact that if you go to the weeklies versus the monthlies, you will do better over the long term. Again, if you can handle the time component. So great questions, everybody. That's going to do it for the office hours. This episode is also going to do it for this episode of the Advisor's Option. Randy, you made it through the whole episode without a hurricane coming and sweeping you off the program. So congratulations to you. And before we go, uh, what's cooking in the land of Swan Global Investments? What updates, what new products do you have coming down the pike that you want to let our listeners know about? Well, um, I... I mentioned this last time we filed the paperwork to launch two new mutual funds at the end of the year. I'm not sure of the exact date, but uh, that's probably the next big thing. We launched our CAT, um, I think, two, maybe two and a half months ago. That's, that's gone pretty well. Um, just for those who do know what a CIT is, Collective Investment Trust, it's a kind of a retirement product that offers lower fees and higher higher levels of fiduciary duties to the people that are operating that. So. That's something, a space that we're very interested in, in doing, and, and we're very excited about the future performance. The last thing I would just bring up is that, uh, you know, we do have a lot of new material on our website. If you go to our um, the blog, as well as some of our resources, there's some new white papers and some new research papers that we put up over the last month or so, actually talking about some of the market environments that, we have, that have occurred in August and September. So pretty good read. Um, if you would like to go to our website and get that off swanglobalinvestments.com. There you go, listeners. You said it. Check it out for yourself, swanglobalinvestments.com, to learn more. In fact, I'm looking right now. 
uh, Randy, at the summer squall or start of the hurricane season article. A lot of great data here in historical implied versus realized volatility in the S&P, and it's been updated for October. So talking about a lot of the big developments that have happened in the market this year and kind of what that means uh, for the prospects going forward. Check it out over there if you haven't done so already listeners a lot of good a lot of good reading to be done over there even if you're not a swan client or a swan user uh, still a lot of interesting data you might want to read and learn about and implement perhaps in your own trading and before we go of course you couldn't make it today but i want to also mention surf on over to optionseducation.org for our friends over there at the options industry council make sure you click on that advisor tab i believe it's in the top right corner of the page so you can see all that great data all the great studies that eric and his team over there have commissioned over the recent years and like randy mentioned earlier in the episode collaring the cues a great great uh, study on how to use how to use collars in your in your portfolio and how they outperform. A lot of great data out there. So if you're looking for even more of that kind of data we touched on the top of the program, optionseducation.org has you covered. On behalf of Eric, who couldn't be here today, and Mike, and indeed Randy, and of course myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the show, and of course for sending in those great questions. Keep them coming. And we'll see you next time right here on The Advisor's Option. Advisors Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisors Option is also brought to you by Swan Wealth Advisors. Since 1997, Swan has been the leader in hedged equity and option income strategies with GIPS verified results. Swan provides unique and valuable solutions to the inherent weaknesses of asset allocation, offering defined risk strategies that allow upside participation while also protecting advisors and investors against market risk. For more information about our advisor program for separately managed accounts, the Swan Defined Risk Mutual Fund, or our proprietary option overlay strategies, please contact Randy Swan at swanwealthadvisors.com. Think outside the style box. Think Swan when deciding on risk management solutions to market risk. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 